Now, this is a, a seminar meeting group uh, where we discuss issues related to the continuity between life and cognition. And I'll, before we present our speaker, I just made a couple of quick, quick announcements. You all may have seen in the announcement that there is a, a blog at the end of the announcement. You may actually look at that, the activity in the blog that participated very interestingly. Um, I was circulating this in case you want to be added to the mailing list for announcement because most of the announcements will be made just within the minor uh mailing list. Uh, this was a special case we made into uh, a bigger uh, <coughs> And uh, quick things from I mean, oh, yeah. Uh, next week uh, we will also have an external speaker. We have Max Bellman coming to talk about uh, reflexive quantum and an activism. And, an activism. and that will be on, on Wednesday. And then there will be a series of, of, of announcements of the future speakers uh, throughout the weeks that come uh, in the rest of the term. And uh, we're trying uh, also to, to get here uh, Brian Goodwin uh, to talk about, about his uh, views of, on biology. And uh, So I'll, I'll circulate this list in case you, you're not a member of uh, Lab 9 uh, mailing list and you'd like to be, just add your email address. So, uh, you know, it's a very, very great pleasure to have here uh, Professor Sean Gallagher, uh, who I believe most of you may, may have heard of and know. Uh, he's uh, Chair of Philosophy at the University of Central Florida. Uh, he has written extensively about uh, embodiment and the relationship with the navigation and the science. And today he's going to be talking about well, a topic that some of you may find interesting. Uh, non representationalism in action. So, okay. Thank you, Thank you very much uh, to uh, the organizers uh, of the seminar to invite me. I'm uh, very pleased to be here. And uh, uh, I also understand that there's at least uh, two groups in the audience, some uh, on one side who champion representationalism, and some on the other who might already be convinced and uh, uh, would be acquired. So, uh, I look forward to the question periodically. <laughs> I just might be that. <laughs> okay. um, I want to emphasize that I want to talk about representationalism and non-representationalism in action. Uh, so the focus of my uh, comments are, are about action itself. Uh, and I'll, you know, I'll probably remind you of that as we go. Okay. Anyway, here's the, uh, the outline of, of the talk. Uh, the, the question I want to address, uh, do actions require representations that are intrinsic to the action itself? Um, I want to set aside other questions uh, about representation, as maybe representation fits into uh, issues having to do with prior planning uh, of, in, uh, of action. Uh, how the prior intention gets formed or shaped. Um, and uh, maybe even as I'm engaged in a complex action, I might uh, find myself going off course a bit and I might sort of uh, become self-conscious of what I'm doing and uh, whether or not representation enters in at that point uh, is also something I'm kind of bracketing and setting off to the side. So I really want to focus on uh, carrying out of the action itself uh, in some, perhaps, narrow sense. Uh, so I will just mention briefly some non-representationalist accounts uh, of this sort of thing. And I will um, then take a closer look at some proposals for what are called uh, minimal representations uh, as they are involved in action. And then I will try to argue that minimal representations really aren't representations at all. So that's uh, something to look about where we're going. And I think uh, it might be good to start with at least one uh, definition of a classical concept of representation. And this is one of, among many. Uh, I, I suppose we could spend uh, an hour going through uh, various accounts of what exactly a representation is and, and taking a look at the various criteria that people uh, seem to give us as uh, defining of representation. 
But here's a recent one by Mark Rollins um, in his book, uh, Body Language, where he very clearly sets out a number of, um, of criteria uh, that uh, the classical concept of representation seems to depend upon. Uh, the first is that a representation is something internal. It's something like an image, perhaps, or a symbol, maybe even a neural configuration. Uh, second, that a representation has a discrete duration. It's an identifiable thing that we can sort of point to. Um, a third feature is that a representation bears content, uh, content that is external to itself. It refers to something other than itself, something external to itself. Um, four, representation requires interpretation. Uh, its meaning derives from a certain processing that takes place within the subject. Um, and five, uh, representation is something passive. It's produced or enacted or called forth by some particular situation. Um, and this is associated with uh, Tretzky's position on this idea. And uh, six, something that Rollins doesn't have in his original list, but I think something that shows up in uh, most conceptions of representation, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about it uh, as we get into it, uh, representation is something that is decoupable. It can be part of an offline process. Um, it can be decoupled from the, the say, the action that is originally uh, in involved in. So uh, some of you are probably familiar with Hubert Dreyfus's uh, uh, view on these issues, uh, his anti-representationalist stance where he argues that for practiced or skillful intentional action, one doesn't require the concept of representation at all. So here is a longish quote from uh, Dreyfus. He says, a phenomenology of skill acquisition confirms that as one acquires expertise, the acquired know-how is experienced as finer and finer discriminations of situations paired with the appropriate response to each. So he takes this concept uh, from Merleau-Ponty, which uh, Merleau-Ponty calls it maximal grip. Maximal grip is the body's tendency to refine its responses so as to bring the current situation closer to an optimal gestalt. Thus, successful learning and action do not require propositional mental representation. Uh, they do not require semantically interpretable brain representations either. So for Dreyfus, uh, the concept of representation really is ruled out here uh, for this kind of action that he's describing. Feel free to find a seat here. So I guess one question uh, we would have about this would be, you know, what takes the place of representations then in this non-representationalist account of action? Uh, and the answer is something like that, uh, this, that it's a form of perceptually based online intelligence which generates action through complex causal interactions in an extended body environment system. So this is Michael Wheeler's uh, description of how we can think about action without having to think about representations being involved. Um, and we'll come back to Wheeler's uh, uh, description uh, a little bit later. Um, one question uh, that is asked not only by Wheeler but by a number of other um, recent theorists is whether this sort of system, as it's described here, could actually do the trick, uh, could actually um, do what it needs to do without any kind of representations at all. And uh, the answer that's given by Wheeler, uh, but also by Mark Rollins and also Andy Clark and Rick Rush, and I suppose a number of other people, uh, is that, well, no, it doesn't really um, uh, suffice to, to talk about complex causal interactions as, as uh, uh, appropriate for, uh, for explaining everything we need to know about action. Uh, and in fact, the concept of minimal representation is introduced as something that's required. So uh, Mike Wheeler uh, calls this following Andy Clark, in fact, action-oriented representations. Uh, Mark Rowland talks about what he calls deeds. I don't really like that term, but uh, 
uh, this other term, pre-intentional uh, pre acts, uh, is the one I'll use, um, and we'll see what that is all about. And then Andy Grush, uh, sorry, Andy Clark and Rick Grush um, uh, talk about certain anticipatory aspects that are built into an emulation process that's directly tied to action. Uh, and in all of these cases, they're talking about this concept of minimal representation. <coughs> so we can start with uh, uh, Mike Wheeler here. That's Mike. Um, uh, he's uh, friendly to Dreyfus's anti-representationalist stance, um, but he nonetheless thinks, uh, and following Clark, uh, thinks that uh, you can't get away uh, from, totally <coughs> from representations, and uh, so he thinks that action requires something like these action-oriented representations. Um, these AORs, action-oriented representations, are temporary egocentric motor maps uh, of the environment, which are fully determined by the situation-specific action required of whatever it is we're talking about, the organism in action, or, or uh, for example, a robot. Uh, so, uh, this is a very pragmatic concept of representation that he's giving us here. Uh, on this model, he says, it's not that the action-oriented representations represent the pre-existing world uh, in some kind of internal image. Um, so that whole idea of it being internal is set aside. Um, or that it maps out in some kind of neural pattern of uh, what this world looks like. Rather, he says, how the world is, uh, is itself encoded in terms of possibilities for action. So it's not that we simply map the world as it is, existing in itself, so to speak, but uh, we map out the possibilities that we're able to take towards that world in these action-oriented representations. So what's represented in these AORs um, is not knowledge that the environment is whatever it is, X, but knowledge of how to negotiate the environment. So these action-oriented representations are action-specific, egocentric to the agent, and they are very much context-dependent. Um, okay. So this is uh, his, his model of minimal representation, and again, we'll come back to uh, Mike's uh, proposal uh, a little bit later. Uh, here's uh, Mark Rowland. Uh, Rowland uh, looks at that list of criteria that he gave for the classical concept of, of representation, and he basically says that's not quite adequate to capture the concept of representation we need uh, for action itself. So to get a more adequate concept of representation, he simply gives up most of those aspects. So he will say not all representations are internal. Uh, they're not all of a discrete duration. They're not all in need of interpretation. Uh, they're not all passive. So um, in that case, uh, he wants to give uh, a more adequate, a more positive account of what would count as a representation, a minimal representation, uh, for action. And here's his new list of criteria. So he would say, and here's the one thing that sort of remains the same, I believe, from the uh, original list, that uh, representation carries information about something which is other than itself, some X which is in the environment, for example. Representation uh, is teleological, uh, that is, it's, uh, as he puts it, it, it tracks, uh, has a specific uh, function of, uh, of tracking, that X in the environment, um, so it keeps uh, track of, uh, let's say, if we're trying to catch a ball, then it's keeping track of the ball. Um, representation, he says, can misrepresent X. All right, that's a common feature of, of uh, the notion of representation. Uh, representation can be combined uh, into a more general representational framework, and representation is decoupable. Uh, from X. That also was on the original list, but not on his list, it was the one I have. But it turns up here again. A a representation is decoupable from X, uh, so X may be absent from the immediate environment and uh, we can still have a representation. 
So, in his uh, book, Body Language, Roland goes on to argue for, in, in favor of this concept of representation as a form of minimal representations in action. And uh, he distinguishes, uh, makes a distinction between subintentional acts and pre-intentional acts. Subintentional acts are what Brian O'Shaughnessy uh, characterized as sort of non-intentional movements that really serve no purpose in regard to the action itself. Um, these are things like moving the tongue in your mouth, I don't know, when you're thinking. Uh, or um, I had a, a, a professor once who uh, sat uh, and delivered uh, lectures, and when he got really excited, uh, he would have his uh, leg crossed like this, and he would be wagging his foot. So this kind of excitement <laughs> was uh, something you sort of noticed when, uh, when everything got very interesting in the lecture. Um, uh, but, you know, did that serve any purpose? I'm not sure. Maybe one could take it as a kind of expression of excitement, but I'm not sure it served him any purpose. Um, and anyway, that's what I think uh, subintentional acts on for O'Shaughnessy would be. Uh, Rollins um, presents us with this different concept, uh, what he calls deeds. Um, deeds to me sound to some kind of moral uh, uh, dimension to the notion of deeds for, for me anyway. So we'll stay with pre-intentional acts. And uh, these are things like uh, the, position of, uh, the positioning of your fingers as you're going to catch a ball. Um, these are, are sort of pre-intentional in the sense that we don't, they're not intentional. I don't, in some sense, depends on how, how you conceive of this, but uh, I'm not uh, consciously deciding or anything like that to put my fingers in a certain position in order to catch the ball. Or if I'm playing some uh, uh, fancy and complicated piano concerto, uh, then the way my fingers are moving on the keys, these are uh, these qualify as pre-intentional acts for uh, Rollins. So pre-intentional acts include, as he puts it, an array of online feedback modulated adjustments that take place below the level of intention, but collectively promote the satisfaction of an antecedent intention. So these pre-intentional um, acts serve, uh, support intentional action in some very real way. And he gives us a detailed example uh, from an experiment done by Arbus back in the 60s, um, this uh, interesting experiment on psychotic eye movements. Some of you might be familiar with the experiment. So the subjects were, uh, were shown a painting uh, which, uh, which contained six women and the arrival of a male visitor. I don't know if you can see the detail there, but that's, that's the thing on top. Uh, and then each uh, subject was uh, asked to do a, a particular task. Here are the tasks. Um, uh, they were asked to do various tasks in turn. So the first would be to simply look at the picture at will. The second task would be to judge the age of the people in the painting. A third, guess what the people have been doing prior to the <coughs> visit. A fourth, remember the clothing worn. Or a fifth, remember the position of the objects in the room. Or a sixth, estimate how long it has been since the visitor was last seen by the people in the painting. And what uh, Yarvis uh, finds is that when you when you measure the visual scan paths or the saccades of the subjects for, for each task, uh, you find that uh, there are different scan paths for each task. Um, and the, the subject, of course, is not aware uh, of these scan paths or saccades, but that somehow or other they are serving uh, the, the, the task that the subject has to accomplish. So uh, subjects who were asked, for example, about the age of the people focused on their faces, moved from face to face, and, and uh, formed those kinds of paths. So uh, basically, it shows that the scan paths vary systematically with the nature of the task. Uh, so in some way, the saccades are governed by the intention of the task, uh, but they're not intentional uh, in the sense that we're not in control of them. Uh, we don't consciously decide to do this. Uh, so these are good examples, according to Rollins, of pre-intentional acts. Right. Now the point is that 
Pre-intentional acts, according to Rollins, are representational. Here's a, a very basic feature of action that, for him, fit the definition that he has given of what constitutes a representation. So, um, for, uh, these, these pre-intentional acts carry information about something. Uh, it might be the tra trajectory of the ball that we're trying to, to uh, catch, or the size of the ball, or the keyboard, or the specific uh, aspect of the people uh, in the painting, uh, in that example. They track X, um, or they function in some way that allows me to accomplish something in virtue of tracking X. So they uh, are trying to catch the ball, and in some fashion that uh, allows me to catch the ball. Um, of course, I can miss the ball, uh, and if I'm playing a concerto, I can hit the wrong keys and so forth. So in some way there can be some something that goes wrong, <coughs> get it wrong, and so these things may in fact be considered uh, misrepresentation. First of all, consider representation. They can be combined into more general representational structure. So I can catch the ball and throw it back. Uh, I can continue the, to play the music or I can systematically scan the painting for different features. And uh, finally, these Pre-intentional acts are decouplable from X. Uh, so X may be absent from the immediate environment. For example, perhaps uh, I can later remember uh, and demonstrate how I caught the ball, uh, replicating the same act, but absent the ball, which is the ball around, and this kind of uh, pantomime. Okay. Uh, the third proposal for the notion of uh, minimal representation it comes from Clark and Grush. Uh, they propose the concept of minimal robust representation in uh, a paper uh, in 1999. Uh, and the example they give is specifically uh, the internal neural circuitry used for anticipatory uh, uh, predictive purposes. Uh, within a forward model or a forward emulator that's involved in motor control. Um, and they would say that uh, this kind of neural circuitry really constitutes a kind of representation in the system uh, in order to control uh, the action. So the circuitry is a model that stands in for a future state uh, of some extra neural aspect uh, of the movement. Uh, or uh, of the environment. So you can think of this as um, this representing in some fashion the end state of my movement uh, or some kind of proprioceptive feedback that I anticipate um, if my movement goes in the right way. Uh, and of course these uh, forward models uh, serve uh, for quick correction uh, even faster than waiting around for the slower feedback get, say, through proprioception. So, uh, in some way, there, this process <coughs> is standing in for a future state of the system. Uh, or we could think of it also as a future state of uh, something happening in the environment. Uh, the MRR, the uh, minimal robust representation, is what they call a decouplable uh, surrogate. So something that stands in and something that can be decoupled uh, from the process itself. Since the emulator anticipates or represents uh, an X that is not there, some future X or future state of X, uh, it is in some sense offline. It's disengaged, as they say, or certainly decouplable from the current X. So for Clark and Grush, this minimal representation um, is an inner state that does not depend on a constant physical linkage between it and the extra neural states which it is about. It's difficult, however, I think, um, to see how an aspect of motor control that really is constitutive uh, of the action, is really an important part of the action, <coughs> how that can be considered disengaged from that from the context or from the action itself. Um, 
because after all it's, it's trying to track certain things. Um, doesn't the anticipation of a future X or a future state of X or a future state of organism uh, require reference to the current state of X, <coughs> uh, to the current motor command, the efference copy, uh, that's part of the input uh, for this uh, circuitry, uh, or the current state of the system. One needs uh, basically a constant reference to, uh, to that type of thing, I believe. And if it's going to play a part in the control of movement, doesn't this have to be a physical connection in some way? I'm not quite sure uh, what they have in mind uh, by, by saying that there's no need for a constant physical linkage. So to think that the anticipatory emulator involves a decoupled process is to think that such anticipations can be detached from perceptual and proprioceptive input. Uh, which I think they clearly cannot be. Uh, it is true, as uh, Clark and Rush say, that this process is one step ahead of real, real world proprioceptive feedback. But what they fail to say, or fail to mention, is that uh, these processes are also at the same time one step behind the previous feedback that we've had from proprioception. And they depend on the ongoing perception of relevant objects in the, uh, in the world that uh, are involved in the action. Um, so it seems to me that really we should say that these processes are part of the online process of action. The process, we might say, registers not simply some future state in the abstract, uh, but really is a way to register the trajectory of the action, where the action not only uh, going, but also where it has just been. So this issue about uh, whether uh, we can talk about a deep coupling uh, of representations, I think is interesting. According to any definition of representation, I believe, representation is something that is decouplable from X, or X may be absent from the immediate environment. But as I, you know, as I have just suggested, it's difficult to see how pre-intentional acts or emulation processes can actually decouple from X, whether X is the ball that we're trying to catch, the piano keys that we're using to play, uh, the, the sonata or uh, concerto, um, the, the uh, painting, or uh, or anything like that, or the context, uh, the action context without becoming something entirely different from what they are in the action at stake. I mean, if you can imagine lifting this, the, the product of the circuitry, uh, so to speak, out of the action process, it's not, it's not, no longer linked to, uh, to the action, uh, in fact, <coughs> not linked to the environment, uh, seemingly disembodied in some fashion. Um, in what sense, uh, then can we consider that um, the same thing that you find in the action itself? So Clark and Grush actually acknowledge this issue. Uh, they say that full-blooded internal representations are fully decoupable inner surrogates for extra neural states of affairs, but they also say that in this case, the case of basic motor emulation, uh, it does indeed fall short of meeting this stricter criteria. The surrogate states are not fully decoupable from ongoing environmental input. So they, they want to make the case for these minimal representations. Um, the example they use in the paper is precisely uh, this uh, emulator model. Uh, and then, uh, sort of towards the end, they say, well, actually, this is not decoupable in exactly uh, the right way uh, to make it a representation. So the neural circuitry correlating to the anticipatory aspect in the emulator turns out not to be a full-blooded representation. It is at best, as Parking Rush suggests, the most minimal entity that we might consider a representation. If we imagine something, if we remember something, or re even reenact kind of action outside of its original context and absent the X uh, that uh, maybe motivated the action. Uh, 
that type of remembering and imagining may or may not require a fully decoupable representation. But this says nothing about representation in action itself. So it's not clear why something that may or may not operate as a representation in a non-action context means that it is necessarily operating as a representation in the action context. So a soccer ball, we could say, uh, can represent the game of football, but we don't kick around a representation during the game. Um, if an emulation process or pre-intentional act can take on representational duties outside of the action, this does not require that they be representational in the action or serve that kind of purpose in the action. Um, I was talking to uh, Manus uh, Zakira, some of you might know him, uh, and he reminded me that uh, about this soccer uh, game, uh, that it's possible, uh, at least if you think of Monty Python's uh, philosophers playing soccer uh, football, uh, that uh, uh, you, you could have philosophers kicking around a representation of the football itself. I don't know if you're familiar with that, and uh, I thought we'd have internet connection here. The little video for you, it's on YouTube, you can go look it up. Uh, uh, but you have Socrates more or less thinking about what you do rather than uh, doing anything. Um, okay. Uh, oh, all right, so back to uh, Mike Wheeler. Uh, but we've seen uh, the three proposals uh, uh, Wheeler, and we're going to look at Wheeler in a little bit more detail here. Uh, Mark Rowland's uh, proposal for minimal representation, and then uh, Clark and Rush, and we've sort of raised some questions about decouplability uh, in, in talking about Clark and Rush's uh, proposal. Wheeler uh, also, I mean, like Clark and Rush uh, at the end anyway, um, Wheeler also gives up the criterion of decouplability as part of his concept of minimal or uh, weak representation. And both Wheeler and Rollins then suggest that minimal, minimal representations involve aspects of a system that is not just something uh, that can be characterized as happening in the brain uh, or even just in the body, but is also invo uh, involving uh, the environment. So as uh, Rollins puts it, the vehicles of representation do not stop at the skin. They extend all the way out into the world. Um, here, Rollins, uh, I think, uh, joins Clark and Wheeler uh, with the, some version of the extended mind hypothesis. Um, and so action-oriented representations are, are pictured as complex causal interactions in, a, in an extended body environment system, um, where in fact the causality is spread around uh, a bit. Uh, Wheeler, uh, both Wheeler and Clark refer to the threat, um, which is a threat to representationalism, I take it, the threat of non-trivial causal spread. And uh, indeed, the commitment to some version of this idea seems to be what uh, motivated uh, the kind of anti-representationalism that we might find in something like uh, Dreyfus uh, or Rode uh, So here's uh, an example taken from uh, Hogman, um, driving from Sussex to London. Uh, how could we do that? Well, we can do that in a number of different ways. Uh, we could have in our minds or in our heads uh, some kind of stored representation, some kind of inner representation of the route that we would have to take. Um, or uh, we might not have that at all. We might just go by uh, the road signs, uh, which are external representations that we might use uh, 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 in order to get from here to there. Um, or it might be that uh, we've driven this route uh, quite often before, uh, and having done it many times, we, we more or less go on automatic pilot, uh, and we allow the landscape and the roads to guide us, uh, where there's no representations uh, required, since in the sense the landscape does the work. Um, uh, if we think of action in, these, in, the, in the third uh, fashion, um, does that rule out, then, representations of the traditional kind? And uh, Dreyfus would certainly say, uh, say uh, it does. And also, I think, uh, the three, uh, three or four theorists that we're considering here, uh, Clark, Wheeler, and uh, Rush, and uh, Rollins, 
uh, would also say it rules out those traditional representations, but uh, it doesn't rule out uh, minimal representations or action-oriented representations. Um, Wheeler, in, indeed, uh, puts a, a noble effort into trying to save action-oriented representations. <coughs> he argues that to go anti-representationalist in an extended cognitive paradigm, um, one needs to understand representations as uh, involving two things. One, uh, <coughs> strong instructionalism. Uh, this is the idea that a representation would somehow provide a full and detailed description of how to achieve the outcome of any action. Um, and what he calls the neural assumption, uh, the idea that neural processes play a central close to exclusive role, so that there's a lot going on in the, in the head. But these are uh, easy targets, uh, uh, in effect, and uh, to uh, the neural assumption uh, is already very much weakened by the extended cognition hypothesis. And uh, there are good reasons also to give up uh, uh, strong instructionalism. Uh, in fact, Dreyfus had already uh, showed that uh, that would be the wrong way to think of, uh, of things uh, altogether in contexts having to do with you know, the common sense background uh, uh, problem and uh, frame problems in AI. Um, so, with such concessions then, uh, according to Wheeler, we, we, we can easily knock down strong representationalism, but we can hold on to a weaker form of representationalism. Uh, uh, and some concept of action-oriented representations that are distributed across brain, body, and environment. So, um, Wheeler wants to say that these action-oriented representations are, first of all, richly adaptive. They are, uh, he calls them, arbitrary, or I would say ad hoc. That is to say, they're not predefined. Um, they're basically involved in processing current information about the world. Uh, and third, um, he would say that they employ a homuncular mechanism, a mechanism that is hierarchically compartmentalized, contributes to a collective achievement. The idea is that the homuncular mechanism takes the information offline and manipulates it, interprets it, in order to anticipate possible actions. So uh, action-oriented representations involves this concept of homuncular uh, processing. This homuncularity, Wheeler suggests, is usually conceived of as involving modularity, so processing in one module uh, independently of processing in another uh, uh, module. Uh, but then there's some kind of communication that happens. Uh, so that uh, one module will interpret uh, the processing uh, result of another. Uh, so this uh, way of conceiving of it um, seems to me to sort of send us back to something that looks very much like the Clark Brush emulator model that we talked about. And uh, still, Wheeler wants to give up the decouplability idea, um, although he wants to say you can take something offline. I'm not totally clear about this distinction that must be there between taking something offline and decoupling it. Uh, I'm not quite sure how that works out. Um, but I think that Wheeler had already given up the decoupability, and uh, this doesn't seem to be something that would work uh, in, uh, in action. So if the batter uh, here uh, uh, hits the ball and we're going to catch it, uh, I'm American, obviously, so uh, I'm using baseball. If you want a really good uh, analysis of cricket, uh, uh, I think Mark Wheeler talks about it, but uh, Mark Rollins, uh, Michael Wheeler talks about it, but also Mark Rollins has a really nice analysis of uh, this type of thing in his book. So we have to track the ball in order to catch it, and the answer is, well, we don't really track it in the kind of straightforward way. We spot the ball at a certain point. Uh, we kind of calculate the angle the, that it's, it's going at. Um, and then, uh, what happens? Well, do we then somehow or other create a representation of it somewhere in the system uh, uh, that we would use to predict uh, at point B where it might be so we can sort of then prepare ourselves to, to catch it? Uh, that, that would be the thing that seems to be involved in these kind of minimal representations. And we would somehow or other 
spot the ball and then create some kind of internal representation of it in order to, to use in order to guide our catching. Um, but uh, another way to think of it, though, is that once we spot the ball, our body simply just goes into a kind of uh, the right sort of movement to put us in a position so that we can catch the ball and representations aren't needed. So, like decoupability, this modularity, this homunculularity, I think can also be given up for a more <coughs> dynamic systems approach. Uh, a, a concept of self-organizing, continuous reciprocal causation. The body going into the right uh, mode of action uh, is that sort of thing, or can be described in that sort of way. And these are concepts you find in a number of people, obviously. Uh, I, I think of Varela, uh, but also Andy Clark talks about it quite a bit. Um, Scott Kelso, but, you know, I don't know uh, who your favorite uh, dynamical systems theorists are. Um, so th that kind of explanation would be more causal uh, and less communicative uh, in terms of interpretation and sending information here and there between modules. Um, it doesn't require the idea that one part of the mechanism interprets the information presented by another part. Uh, and uh, instead, uh, what you end up with is an embodied, inactive action perception model where perception and action are closely linked, uh, coupled, and both have a temporal dynamic structure. Uh, so there's a way, I think, to, uh, to get around the, the need for these minimal representations that Wheeler seems to think we do need, even in action. So Wheeler's concept of action-oriented representations, uh, which he defines as perception-based, short-lived, egocentric, spatial mapping of the environment, calibrate, calibrated strictly in terms of possible actions. That's one aspect uh, um, uh, that involves some kind of dynamic processes, uh, you could say. Clark and Grush's uh, minimal representations, this kind of anticipatory aspect built into a forward comparator or, or emulator for online motor control is another aspect that we could take up in a dynamic systems approach. And Roland's uh, deeds or pre-intentional uh, actions uh, uh, constitute a third uh, aspect of this. So each of these are aspects of a, a, a model, I think, that we could characterize. Um, here I'm using uh, Husserli and phenomenological terms uh, uh, that someone like Varela has, um, has uh, used in terms of dynamic systems, also Van Gogh. Uh, um, so, so each of these aspects uh, involve a kind of retentional, impressional, protentional aspect, online processing, uh, it's not, in other words, a, a snapshot representation of the ball at A and then at B, um, but rather, you know, I see the ball at A moving towards B, or I see an A-B trajectory, and uh, that sets uh, uh, the body uh, to moving in the right way for the catch. Okay. So at this point, my question is simply, what's the point uh, in retaining the term representation. What work does it really do, since uh, there is no literal representation of anything, uh, since it's not consistent with most aspects of the classical notion of representation, and since in working out the detailed explanation of, of the action and the motor control and so forth, one is already explaining action in a non-representational uh, way by focusing on perception-based complex causal interactions in this kind of extended body environment system. So there's a, what I might call a facetious economic argument against representations here. The work that the term representation does is less than the work uh, it takes to justify the use of the term representation. Uh, and if that's the case, uh, we probably don't want to use the term. Um, What's left of the idea of representation in action? Well, the process that you know, people are referring to as representational is no longer internal. It extends to include embodied environmental aspects and is only weakly neural. It's no longer a discrete, enduring thing. It's more like a dynamical, distributed process. It's no longer passive. It's rather inactive proactively contributing to the rich adaptability of the system. 
it's no longer decouplable. Indeed, uh, if it is going to be teleological, in order to track things uh, in the right way, uh, it has to be connected, it has to be um, coupled uh, in the right way to the environment. Um, it's no longer strongly instructional, that's been given up a while ago. Uh, it's much more adaptive and ad hoc uh, and minimal. Um, it's no longer homuncular, there's no modularity required, no interpretation required in that system, uh, as long as we go for the more dynamic uh, uh, system. So, in effect, the process that theorists are calling uh, minimal representation no longer conforms to the criteria that would make it a representation. Actions and the motor control processes, uh, the pre-intentional acts that underpin actions, are dynamically uh, related to uh, environmental contexts. Uh, they're processes that make up an action um, and that refer to something or some state of affairs other than the action itself. Uh, so that idea is still there. Uh, they're teleological. Um, action control processes sometimes track things in the world, um, but this is an inactive kind of perceptual tracking. I see the ball I, I want to catch uh, that I want to catch, and my bodily posture and movements go into dynamic relation to the changing conditions of its trajectory. Uh, it's also fallible. Right? Uh, we wouldn't say this is misrepresentation because we were saying it's not representation in the first place. But actions can fail not because of a misrepresentation, but because perception is finite and fallible. Things look climbable from a certain distance, but they might turn out not to be because I get closer. Things look catchable, uh, but they, they might in fact turn out not to be. So uh, what I want to recommend, or what I would defend uh, here uh, as, as my conclusion, is a kind of scientific pragmatism about representationalism. Uh, is it helpful? Uh, is it a kind of shortcut way of explaining action? Or does it explain anything at all? Uh, I think Clark and Grush themselves put it just the right way. Here's what they say. They said, it is of course true that the emulator circuitry can also and simultaneously be viewed simply as a smaller dynamical system linked to the one that hooks directly into the real world. But that is just as it should be. The question is whether of these descriptions, uh, I'm sorry, the question is which of these descriptions is most useful for cognitive science. Um, so I would argue that at best, representation is just one way, a scientifically abstract way, of explaining the action process. A lot of people use <coughs> the concept of representation in this fashion, but it's not an explanance that does any work itself. Uh, it's a concept under which one still needs to do all the explanation. Um, and that explanation has to sort of take the form of this kind of dynamical systems uh, approach. And finally, the risk uh, that comes along <coughs> with uh, representationalism uh, is a kind of ontological temptation uh, to think that there really are discrete entities called representations that are in the system. And that they are something more than what a motor system motor control system does um, as part of the action itself. So I'll stop there. Non-representationalist talk 
in order to explain the full gamut of cognitions. But it seems that there's a bit that in your, in your very opening slide, you ruled out everything else. So we're just talking about action. But I didn't think Clark and Ian other people really particularly worried about whether you can explain action in, in dynamical systems, because actually they're very, very friendly to those accounts. What they're worried about is whether you can, you can scale these things up. So for instance, they say, well, he Brooks, you know, he just, he just picks and chooses his problems, you know, things where exactly there are um, information and you have the right set. I think you could go along with all of this and still say, you know, you, you haven't touched really representationalism. Because representationalism is, you know, worried about these other classes of things. So I think the question is whether, still the question is, whether you can explain the other things at all without representation. Yeah. I think that still is a question. Uh, and uh, for purposes of this talk, I left that as an open question. What I'm, what I'm concerned about is how we characterize action, because I think the way we characterize action will play an important role in how we explain those other things. So if we don't get this right, then <coughs> how we might go about explaining some of the other issues uh, would be uh, already, in some way, going on the wrong track. Um, and so when I look uh, at Mike Wheeler and Mark Rollins and Clark and Grush, for example, uh, they are talking about action in those specific uh, texts that I'm, I'm looking at. And they're saying, well, we do need no more representations here, just in these types of things. Um, so that, I mean, I, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a kind of narrow target that I, I've uh, uh, identified here. And uh, what I want to try to do is sort out right here what, what we should say. And then with the representational hungry kind of scenarios, then um, then I would say, let's go from here, what we said about action, and see what we can or cannot do without uh, representations, or where representations do happen. All right. And I think there are ways, probably, to take it so that representations might not have to even come into those cases. But, uh, but the first task would be to get the, the action. I mean, I'm going to kind of follow up on, on that question and your answer. All of the examples of action you took were actions which we could regard as learned, possibly skilled even, if one uses that word generally. I think that people have done many times already, and they were redoing them in this new instance. Are you going to apply your stance with respect to representation, or the lack of the need of it, in the evolution of the ability to be able to do that? <clears throat> Are you saying only... <clears throat> that you don't need representation after the learning and at the point where the thing becomes habituated or skilled, or are you saying you don't need representation at all the previous stages? Right. So, uh, I am uh, indeed uh, thinking about practice action, and uh, it's, it seems to me, depending upon, I guess, uh, how we want to characterize what's, what's going on with, uh, say, the use of the imagination uh, or memory, context where we're learning a certain action, learning how to do something, or uh, even learning uh, dance, or how to play an instrument, or stuff like that, um, that uh, if, uh, if it turns out that, uh, you know, we want to characterize imagining and, uh, and be keeping some, some things in mind as representational type things, um, uh, then uh, it, you know, one could say, yeah, well, representation may in fact be involved uh, as a learning action. Uh, and then we somehow jettison representation as we go on. Uh, I think uh, <coughs> even someone like Dreyfus might might admit this with his you know notion of expertise as opposed to early uh, early things. But then also, if you think that, as Dreyfus himself says, we're expert in a lot of things already. You know, if we're expert walkers, uh, for example. Uh, and if complex actions are in some way built up out of some of these movements that we're quite expert in, uh, then perhaps we could build them up out of things that we, we don't need uh, representations uh, uh, to be part of. Uh, so uh, if I'm practicing to reach uh, uh, for something or to throw something, uh, part of, at least part, I think, of the action that's involved, even in practice, even in, in learning something, uh, is already uh, tuned to the environment in the right way, such that we don't need representations. So, uh, 
again, as I said uh, in the beginning, uh, whether, uh, for example, if we're planning out an action, if we're thinking about how to do something, uh, if we're deliberating about an action, uh, whether we need representations there, uh, I left that as an open question. And I was really looking at the, the actual action components. So I'm dodging uh, that. <laughs> Uh, my name is Keith Murray. Uh, thanks for coming, Scott. Can I offer a little speculation on homunculi? Okay. Uh, for me, the uh, most likely way a homunculus can exist is as an attractor. Now, um, should uh, the homun uh, the uh, my immediate thoughts come toward um, schizophrenia, wherein the, the victim applies so much energy to his attractor that builds up within him, that eventually it begins to dissociate and begin to address him, and thus he hears voices. Um, now, on a lighter note, a homunculus can be an object of uh, some mirth or humour in, in science. Um, but um, furthermore, if it was a homunculus with a strange attractor, it therefore would not be necessary, as far as I'm concerned, to be, for it to remain within the mind of the person. However, modularity, I think, is supposed to work against strangeness in that context, yet modularity would then be important to collapse the strange attractor as necessary. Subsequently, in extremis, it may be possible for your homunculus or strange attractor, while you are standing outside Ruth's steakhouse in Washington, D.C., stroking your chin, to fly into someone else's head, whereupon he realizes your need and rushes out to buy your steak. That's the humour. I didn't raise a big laugh. <laughs> okay. Do you see the link with the attractor, though, that I'm trying to make? Yeah. Um, so you would uh, characterize uh, content in, in, in dynamical systems, attract that type of attractor, yeah. yeah, yes, yes. uh, as a, a kind of homunculus. Yes. Uh, Sorry, I, I, I consider an attractor as a kind of homunculus. I hadn't thought of that. I would think of the homunculus as an attractor, but uh, perhaps it's... Oh. oh. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Then. No, neither am I. I'm sorry. <laughs> so should I show you that there are few hands here to this thing I'm wrong? Um, I just wondered if you, if you could um, say a little uh, of whether you thought of um, this discussion about representations in relation to discussions about intentionality. And I think often people, th those two discussions often sort of get um, merged, possibly confused. But there's a way of thinking about intentionality, I think, that maybe sort of counts against the, the sort of um, the way you're, you're presenting the view. You know, the traditional view of intentionality is that um, it's, a, it's a property of um, you know, things in, in the mind, or um, possibly communications based on things which express, express the mental um, particulars of some sort of other. And one sort of corrective to that, one, one line of, of an argument which um, tries to challenge that view is that certain kinds of actions, and that's the sorts of actions that we, we've really been focusing on, seem to exhibit a kind of intentionality um, in virtue of the fact that they seem to have sort of a relation to something external, for example, catching a ball or grabbing a hand or something. Yeah. Also that they seem to exhibit a, a sort of decouplability um, in a sense that you perhaps consider them, you know, pass over because you can miss that hand the ball. And so they seem to, so you could say that, you, you could be quite friendly to the idea um, that actions have intentionality as a way of sort of developing um, a line of thought that possibly isn't that foreign to some of the sort of inactive ideas that you also find to um, So I just wondered yeah, if you, you know, might like to. Right. Well, um, I mean, I, I come at this from a phenomenological 
term intentionality is very important to me. Uh, but there is um, a concept of intentionality, sometimes it's referred to as fundamental intentionality or operative intentionality, <coughs> that you find uh, emphasized, you find it in Husserl, but you find it emphasized by Noah Ponty. And Noah Ponty says uh, this uh, fundamental or operative intentionality really characterizes bodily motor behavior. It's not something in the mind, it's not something necessarily um, conscious. I mean, Husserl thinks of intentionality as characterizing consciousness. Um, but Merleau-Ponty says, no, the body, uh, you know, to the